Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Thursday, September the 26th, 2019 session in our series on international technology management. This year, our theme is about edge computing. I'm Richard Dasher. I direct the U.S. Asia Technology Management Center. And if you believe that I started this series when I was only three years old, I can tell you that we've been doing this series of uh, lectures for 27 years now. We pick a different theme every year and we examine the newest kind of information that we can get, not only about work that's being done here in some technical area, but also work that's being done in Asia in some technical area. So uh, first of all, I'll talk a little bit about the series itself and then kind of get into edge computing and what that's all about, talk about the drivers of uh, edge computing adoption, and then look a little bit at upcoming sessions in this series. So the first biggest message is welcome to everybody. We're really happy that you're here. I know that this is not required for anybody if you're a student, and uh, it's wonderful to have a mixed audience of people from inside Stanford and people from outside Stanford. One of the things that I've always wanted as we've done these series over the years is to have more dialogue between these two groups so that you get to know the industry people and why they come to these sessions and what things they're interested in. And conversely, let's hear from the student side how things look to you and what kind of fresh ideas you might have uh, in regard to the general topic of this of the of the series. So we'll be going every Thursday from now until December the 5th. We'll skip Thanksgiving Thursday, of course. Um, we are an industry affiliates program uh, that was in electrical engineering for 25 years and for the last two years has been under Stanford Global Studies in the School of Humanities and Sciences. So uh, we are interdisciplinary. Our continuing mission is to uh, introduce trends and current developments in the intersection of a particular area of technology and business. So these are not serious technical presentations, but there is a lot of technology involved. So if you feel uncomfortable, either because there's too much technology or too little technology, you're in exactly the right place. Uh, we think that uh, having a discussion from both perspectives will help everybody to understand what's going on and find useful things uh, for yourselves. So we do make special reference to the US and Asia. We have some people coming in from Europe who will be speaking in this seminars. Uh, but mostly this is about US and Asia because of kind of traditionally there's not as much knowledge exchange across the Pacific as you would think. Uh, and we have the speaker slides and also videos for the last at least six or seven years of these programs up on the web. So if you're interested in a particular topic, run a search and you'll likely find us for it. Um, yeah, you can see how these things go. Let's look at edge computing, which is really the next major architectural stage in the evolution of networked information processing. Uh, thanks to uh, Microsoft for having these cute, you know, arrow-shaped uh, templates that you can use. Really, there are four stages that I would say have occurred or are occurring in this history of networked information processing. Mainframe terminal, client server, cloud computing, and finally, edge computing. So to look at these in a little bit more detail, the era of the mainframe terminal goes way back. Am I the only person in the room who remembers Wilbur? Does anybody else remember Wilbur? That was Stanford's mainframe. And uh, a lot of things were done on Wilbur. It was time access. And so if you really had a program that required some number crunching, you kind of had to do it in the middle of the night. Uh, so the clients were really dumb terminals. The first computer I ever had, even a PC, you couldn't display graphics on the PC. You had to buy a special graphics card. 
The connectivity was uh, by a private custom network on timeshare. And that meant that the software for these systems were not compatible with each other. Um, I worked for a Japanese company in the early 1990s. And with a company with only 50 people in it, we had our own mainframe computer because nobody had a PC. The mainframe did financial processing, it did personnel records, it did you know the basic forms and kind of stuff, but there was absolutely no compatibility between our computer and our customer's computer. So uh, you know that was the way things started out. Notice how you had people who were doing data processing, right? Uh, the second stage was really when the engineering workstation came along. And engineering workstations were very powerful individual desktop units that could do a lot of things. And if you could network them together, you could communicate, you could do group projects, you could do all kinds of things. I remember when I first got to Stanford in McCullough Building, I helped run Ethernet cable under the ceiling, or on top of the ceiling, to uh, link the different computers in our own little uh, network. So uh, at that point in the early part of this era, which was really around 1980, it was mostly workstations and a few PCs. And later you had PCs, workstations, and also peripherals, printers and so forth, on the client side. And during this era, internet protocol took over. So that pretty soon, the definition of a network was not what kind of protocol you were using. It was basically some sort of you know, firewall or something else. The um, standardization of the application software could happen at this point. This was the era of the Wintel monopoly, right? Windows and Intel. And things like uh, whatever could run on the client, especially in the later stages, Microsoft Word, Microsoft Outlook, Microsoft whatever. And the intensive processing intensive applications would still run on the server somewhere. The server would also access to things like a central database and so forth near the end of that uh, era. So from dumb terminals with all the processing in the mainframe, suddenly you have a lot of processing happening out on the client side and some processing being done inside the server that's kind of unifying the group. Along about the time the smartphone came along, this evolved into the era of cloud computing. And what happens in cloud computing is you have all sorts of different client types with various levels of intelligence. Probably smartphones and PCs are still the dominant ones, but you've got tablets, you've got MP3 players, you've got sensors, you've got smart appliances, coffee cups, movie tickets, anything can be connected to this cloud now. And um, really, internet protocol is by far the dominant thing that is being used to connect the clients into the internet. And really, a local area network is nothing more than some sort of a secure uh, position on the internet. Most of the processing has gone into the cloud. What happens is that a copy of the device's operating system and the application it's trying to run will go into some server in some data center through a process called virtualization. And so there will be a virtual machine, meaning a copy of the client, inside the data center that will be where all of the actual processing in the application happens. This is efficient because you can have three million cell phones all connected up and, and you know, however many different operating systems. You can have 90 9% capacity use on your servers uh, instead of running every single one of those three million devices independently. So it's a much more efficient uh, way to handle the processing, power efficient and so forth. Um, 
some interesting things. The legal system still hasn't figured out how to deal with some aspects of this. If you are infringing somebody else's copyright, where do you sue the person? Do you sue the person where the client is, or do you sue the person where the server is? Because the server may be in Finland. And if you're trying to uh, in, engage in real severe political kind of, you know, whatever, legal issues like that, in some countries, you can remove the physical server from the data center if you can identify it. In other countries, you cannot. So the legal system still hasn't caught up with cloud computing, but this is where we are now. We have hit the era of cloud computing full on. To, uh, back in 2016, so three years ago, uh, there was a survey of almost 1,000 IT professionals uh, that were, ha is conducted yearly. And in the 2016 survey, about 72% of them said that their company was using at least one cloud application. By 2018, that number had gone up to 96%. So it's ubiquitous. Uh, what kind of things are being done in the cloud? Email. Of course, Gmail is a cloud application. All you're doing is the reading and inputting on your device. All of the processing of the emails are happening in some data center somewhere. Stanford's email system is the same way. Uh, you have other things that are, are very you know, useful thing, customer relationship management, voice over internet protocol, human resource management, help desk kind of thing. The interesting thing about these particular areas this shows how many, what percentage of companies in their sample are actually using the cloud for uh, these different business functions. And the middle-sized companies, companies between 500 and, 1, and 100 and 500 employees, actually have a higher use of the cloud than do the big companies. Partly because the big companies have their own private setups and um, they don't need the standard applications that are provided by some third-party vendor. Um, now, we get to the edge. So you've still got this kind of cloud in the middle, and what's happening is that there's a lot of intelligence in the devices at the edge, in the clients at the edge. You've got in addition to smartphones, which continue to become more and more like miniature computers, you've got connected cars, you've got airplanes doing a lot of information processing being connected, you have drones, you have networked robots, and for the things that are less intelligent, sensors in a smart factory, you will have some sort of an edge server or a gateway server or a micro data center out near the edge. Um, and in regard to connectivity, what you're seeing is integration of really high speed mobile access as well as fixed network access. So our, our um, presentation next week is by Professor Paul Raj on 5G networks. And really from 5G, you cannot tell the difference between mobile and not mobile. Um, so, uh, you, it's interesting how this is basically an optimization problem where some applications, you really want to run them at the edge because it takes too much time, too many nanoseconds for the electric signal to get to the data center and be processed in the data center and get back. Now, that sounds kind of hard to imagine, but if you're running a self-driving car, uh, you really don't want the data to go all the way to the data center and back before you, in order to avoid some obstacle. So um, really, it's an, a continuing optimization. One of the things that's happened in IT is with the, in, the spread of artificial intelligence, there's this need for huge amounts of data to process some problems, especially in business analytics. So business analytics tend to be close, done closer to the cloud, whereas the real-time applications, 
navigating your drone uh, tend to happen more out at the edge. You get rid of all the latency involved in going back and forth to uh, some data center some, some you know, thousands of miles away. Um, it's important to remember that edge computing does not replace cloud computing. So unlike the client-server era and the mainframe era, the mainframe era kind of pretty much declined, although you can still buy mainframe IBM computers, I think. But really, edge computing is sort of an add-on to the cloud computing uh, structure. Um, you'll see this processing at the edge for some things I just mentioned and processing that requires a lot of data or heterogeneous data from various sources will tend to be done more in the cloud. You'll also hear the term fog computing. And fog is typically this sort of micro data center range in between the edge devices and the cloud. So if you think of a rack of servers, typically they'll define a micro data center as anything with less than five racks of servers. Uh, this is in the fog. And again, it's an optimization problem. How do you get the processing done in the most efficient way um, possible? So why is this happening? First of all, the amount of data generated is just exploding. I've got a couple of slides on that. And a lot of the data that's being created, like this real-time data as your self-driving car is running down the road, is so transient, it doesn't make sense to store it in a data center at all. Keep it at the edge, deal with it there. There's this huge demand for, in, for more real data real-time data processing, concerns about privacy and security actually kind of drive edge computing. It's really hard to share medical data between one hospital and another. And if you're doing an analysis of data using the cloud, what happens is the data that you have on your edge device, whether that's a computer or a little mainframe or a little data center inside your company at the edge is going to be copied into some database, a new file, right, into some database in the data center where it will be put along with a lot of other data for the analysis. That process of copying increases the security risk. And so the HIPAA regulations in the US make it really difficult to do that. Uh, so this argues for doing more analysis of the data at the edge. And we've got a company coming in in a few weeks that has a really interesting solution to uh, how to combine data from lots of different hospitals in an analysis, but have the data analyzed inside each of the hospitals, not inside the center in the cloud. Uh, another thing that's really driving the growth of edge computing is um, a new life in the semiconductor industry. So most of the computer chips in the um, data centers, in the big racks in the data centers, are either CPUs or GPUs, graphic processing units. So NVIDIA has made tons of money selling GPUs into the data center. Um, and this is fine. They're multi-purpose chips, though. And so if you can design a single purpose or an application specific chip, right, an ASIC, you can usually make it run even faster and with less power consumption, which means it's great for edge devices. So this kind of new wave of computer chips is also driving uh, the uh, growth of edge computing. We will have a presentation in two weeks from the director of AI marketing from Intel, uh, who is a good friend. And, and so I'm glad that we can have this coming up, too. Um, yeah, this explosion of data. Look what is going into the central cloud. Back in the old days, it was all form-based, what the, uh, the technical term is structured data. And then you have blogs and social media 
click-through data and so forth that the technical term is unstructured data. Along about 2015, there was more sound files and video files floating around the internet than there were text files. That was a major kind of turning point. Uh, and it's not all Netflix. A lot of it is thanks to Alexa and Siri and, and this group. But we're really right at the early ages of you know, a lot of Internet of Things data. Sensor data, uh, connected smart devices, robots everywhere. Each time you have a new type of data coming in, you have to reconfigure your analytics to be able to deal with it. There's a lot of really interesting comp startup companies out there now that are bringing in new types of data to very old problems. So um, there was a company, what is the name of this company? Zest Financial, I think, that uh, has the ability to look at lots of different kinds of data, including how long it takes you to fill out the form that they put in front of you and you're, if you're applying for credit. And so they have a huge uh, uh, joint partnership with the uh, Chinese e-commerce company JD.com now that allows extension of credit for e-commerce to people who are unbanked. They've never had a bank account. They don't have a credit card. And so this is kind of the new thing that you're getting by using these new data types. But as this new data comes online, one of these graphs, right, for the exponential increase in the amount of data that is created. Now, just to give you an idea of what they're really talking about, if a gigabyte was the size of one brick, a zettabyte would be the size of the Great Wall of China. So around 2010, there was a little over one zettabyte of data that was created during the entire year. By the year 2025, the prediction is that there will be more than 160 zettabytes of data created and, uh, during that particular year. Some of it will be stored long term. A lot of it won't. One of the interesting things about this is that the real-time data is going up like crazy. Um, about 40 or 45 zettabytes of real-time, transient data is predicted to be created in the year 2025. So um, one of the problems with this kind of new IoT data is that it's unpredictable. If you have a fire or an explosion or something unusual happening, all of the sensors in the factory may go haywire and fire off all at once. So suddenly you get this huge spike in the amount of data that you've got. That's a challenge for you know, processing of the data. And so the real-time data, the closer you can keep it to the edge, the better it will be. Um, how much money are we talking about? Follow the money, right? So uh, I looked at five different market research reports on edge computing. And just for comparison, I looked at three other market research reports on uh, cloud computing. All of these were published this year. None of them are, are older than, than 2019. Uh, but they would look at you know, four, of the, or four of the five edge computing ones started off in the year 2018. One of them started off in 2019. And you see a wide range of predictions for how big the edge computing market is going to be in the year 24, 2024, 2025. You see quite a wide range in the cumulative annual growth rates that are predicted uh, by these numbers. But if you'll notice some things about this, notice how much bigger, first of all, the cloud computing market is than the, um, the edge computing market. So edge computing is still almost a subset of cloud computing. Uh, they're not directly contiguous. Be careful, they're, they're, they're pulling their data in different ways. But if you have a cloud computing market of somewhere around $700 billion a year, that's twice the size of the semiconductor industry. 
that's really uh, about half the size of the entire retail industry in the world. And so it's, you know, this is huge, huge amount of money and quite respectable. <laughs> Growth rates that are interesting to venture capitalists, right? When you get over 25%, uh, the VCs start to pay attention. Um, go ahead. Forms projection, or is this actually each form trying to project the entire industry? These were independent market research reports. So each one of these market research reports, and these have nothing to do with these, okay? They're separate reports. Yeah. Um, and one reason that that's an important point is because there are so many differences in how they calculate and forecast the size. Most of those are definition differences. Are they looking in the narrow sense at just edge computing services as opposed to other cloud computing services? Or are they looking at a broader definition that would include some of the growth of related technology businesses? So for example, 5G networks, which we're going to talk about some more, are predicted to be a huge market. What's the overlap between the market research predicted for 5G and the market research predicted for Edge? It's probably quite a big overlap. The two are really going to grow uh, in tandem with each other. And really, some of the cost of a connected car is going to be related to the data transfer problem, the Edge computing problem. Um, yeah, most cars have a lot more information processing power than my old PC did back in uh, the year 1982. Uh, so some of the value of the cars that are going to be sold, of the energy systems that are going to be delivered, will come from the computing power. Should that be in included in the uh, definition of what they're measuring, it varies from company to company. But... Um, Consistently across, you see how big cloud computing is. And you also see that the um, growth rates predicted for edge computing are higher than the growth rates predicted for cloud computing. Uh, that's another kind of important indication that edge computing is becoming more and more uh, important to uh, the world as we know it. So. If you turn this into practical use cases, what are we talking about? First thing, smart buildings. If you do a search on Internet of Things, IoT, it seems to me that 80% of what I'm seeing coming through the news now is all about devices for the home. You know, smart thermostats or smart speakers or whatever. But there's also... Uh, not only homes, but factories, warehouses, I could have said hospitals. Uh, smart manufacturing process control is also an edge computing function. You've got the self-driving cars that people talk about all the time when they talk about um, edge computing. Drones, airplane systems, uh, connected car services. These are the services besides actually running the car, but uh, how you're going to have location-based advertising and so forth. Um, mobile augmented reality, networked gaming is going to be a driver of e-commerce. And things like Amazon Go, registerless stores. That information is being calculated somewhere. Some of it's being calculated on your Edge device, your cell phone, and other is going into some sort of a local server. Healthcare monitoring, wearable medical devices. Uh, part of this is the security and privacy issue, and part of it is the fact that that's real-time data. Uh, if, if your heart is starting to do strange things, you don't want to hear about it three hours from now. Um, physical security and surveillance systems. We'll see some examples of these, especially when we look at what's going on in Asia. Energy systems, telemedicine, agricultural systems control. 20 years ago, NASA and Stanford had a really interesting joint project on telesurgery. The networks just weren't ready for it then. Uh, 
now you're really getting to the point where you could probably have telesurgery where the actual data transfer time to go 30,000 kilometers to a synchronous orbit satellite is too long to have the surgery being managed up in the cloud somewhere or by the satellite, right? So you want to do it at the edge. And maybe virtual assistants. And I put this up because I'm really not sure just how much of your conversation with Alexa is happening locally and how much of it's happening in the data center. Certainly, she's getting her information in the data center, right? She's doing her analysis back in the data center. But the actual processing of you know, um, text to speech, the actual uh, understanding of what you're saying to her, I'm not sure how much of that's done at the edge and how much of it's done in the cloud. Does anybody know? OK, we'll leave that one, find out, see if we can find out. Go ahead. All the with all the assistance, the privacy concerns yeah. with data being offloaded. Right. Data um, but as early as um, a couple years ago, I was hearing about Google actually installing much more ML hardware on their devices. So even say they're like tiny little Google devices, yeah. um, do a lot of the processing on board. Actually. Great. Thank you. That's thanks very much. Great to have that. Um, so the second half of what I wanted to talk about today was the kind of regional perspectives. What's going on? Why are we doing this series with the question mark, different directions for the US and Asia? Um, first of all, edge computing has definitely hit the Asian IT world. Uh, some of these market research reports are predicting Asia to have the highest growth rate of edge computing of any region in the world. And uh, a lot of people in Asia say that edge will be important. There was a survey done a couple of years ago uh, by this company of almost 10,000 uh, people. About 25% of them were executives, 25% were IT professionals, 25% were other business people in Asia, and I forget, I think the other 25% might have been independent consultants. But in Southeast Asia and North Asia and Australia and New Zealand, 62% had plans to start edge computing projects within the next three years, and 97% of them had plans or said that edge computing would be a relevant part of their business or IT strategy beyond the three-year limit. So does that kind of look a little bit like this um, cloud computing graph that we saw? This one, where in 2016 you had 72% of the companies had a cloud application and now you've got 96%. So it's very much a few years behind cloud, but definitely going in the same direction. Um, Asia has been deploying a lot of really interesting edge computing projects. Uh, some of them in China involve a test bed, or, or things like a test bed in Tianjin for video optimization and security monitoring. Uh, China Telecom has this smart parking project in Yunnan and in Guizhou. And there's actually a similar project in uh, Taiwan that's being sponsored by a different uh, telecom company. One interesting thing about those two examples, next week we're going to talk about 5G networks. And regulation in China divides up the responsibilities of mobile versus fixed for communications. So China Telecom is the, the fixed telephone company, right? Uh, the old wireline group. And China Unicom was the mobile communications company. Suddenly, they're in each other's turf. And so it'll be interesting to see how the Chinese government uh, angles that. I would say that Baidu's uh, Apollo platform which is a technology development and also operation platform for self-driving cars, is a good example of an edge computing project. Um, Taiwan has got this uh, smart streetlight system. 
there's a nice photograph of this you can find on the internet. So this is actually in operation now, where um, to save power, they've got uh, edge computing going on in each of the streetlights. Um, this spring, South Korea announced the world's first 5G-enabled autonomous vehicle test bed, which is actually a district of regular streets. So normal people are driving through this area too. It's not a closed track. Uh, and this was, they claim to be the first one in the world. They have uh, said that they're going to build out their nationwide 5G uh, network by next year. So I'm hearing not only government uh, investments involved in this. The, uh, this. This project is actually run out of Hanyang University, although it has government money behind it and a lot of company money behind it too. But um, I'm hearing that the Korean big companies like Samsung and, and uh, Hyundai and so forth, SK, KT, are planning on investing upwards of $20 billion in edge computing in the next few years. Um, maybe that's because the Japanese have said that they're going to put $14.4 billion into it. Japan was a little bit behind. And so they came to the table late, but they're definitely trying to move forward with these major investments. And uh, Docomo also has one of these projects that's looking for video analytics um, to be done on surveillance cameras. Um, yeah, we'll see how that goes with the data privacy <laughs> issues, too. Now, what about the different directions? The reason that I really started to put this series together was uh, over the last couple of years, I'm watching this process of decoupling between the US and China. And so what's going to happen, right? A lot of the things are in the news. There are restrictions on US firms from buying equipment or selling hardware or software to a certain list of companies that the government maintains that are considered national security concerns. Huawei and ZTE were put on the entity list, but then they have kind of temporarily been removed off of it. Um, and so what happened as a result? Huawei developed their own operating system. And the reports about this Huawei operating system for cell phones that I see is that it really is very different from Android, which is what uh, they used to use. Uh, Huawei and Alibaba have both announced their own AI processing chips. The interesting thing about Alibaba's chip is they don't plan to sell it. It will only be used for company internal uh, applications. Um, the U.S. administration is putting pressure on firms to move their manufacturing back to the U.S. So uh, that's happening some, but it's also moving manufacturing out of China and into Vietnam. So um, this is one of the things where the global supply chains are definitely realigning. And there's a lot tighter monitoring and control of foreign investment inside the United States. Um, Kai-Fu Lee wrote AI Superpowers, uh, has his investment firm, Sinovation. And Sinovation appears to have pulled out of American investments. Now, it's kind of questionable as to whether this is serious and permanent or whether the person who was here in Silicon Valley has just kind of gone home for a while. But um, clearly, their investment portfolio has moved much more toward China than, and out of here. They do have investments in about 40 companies here, and so somebody is still taking care of them. Um, a couple of uh, some acquisitions by Chinese companies have been blocked. Some Chinese investors have been ordered to divest from their U.S. investments. And so not surprisingly, look what happened from Chinese foreign direct investment to the U.S. From $46 billion in the year 2016, we are now down to one-tenth of that, $4.8 billion in 2018. So as the money doesn't come, the systems may get more and more different. The ecosystems may get more and more different. Uh, 
and it's not only the U.S. administration. China is also focusing more domestically. Things like the indigenous innovation policy, things like the Made in China 2025, which has kind of been backpedaled by the Chinese government, are definitely aimed at doing more things independently and not having connections to the way the technologies are developing here. Um, there's a new set of cybersecurity policies coming online in, in China, net, uh, November, I think. And they appear to have kind of special targeting of foreign firms. Okay, well, what goes around comes around. If we do that with investors, that's going to happen on the other side of the Pacific. Um, and Chinese regional influence is increasing. I was very shocked to find that trade between China and the rest of the Indo-Pacific region is twice as much as the trade between China, uh, between the U.S. and the Indo-Pac region. Uh, so China accounts for 24% of exports from Indo-Pac, and the U.S. accounts for 12% of exports from Indo-Pac. Now, a lot of this, these two bullets had to do with components being made in one Asian country and being shipped to China for final assembly, and then they would go to some other market. Well, what's happening is the some other market is no longer the U.S. and Europe. It's domestic China. So you're really seeing a major difference in the way business is being done. The Regional Cooperation Economic Partnership, I think that's what that stands for, is uh, still going on. The negotiations are still continuing. China, this is China's answer to the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which the U.S. pulled out of as soon as uh, our current administration started. So um, Japan, is, Japan and Australia have tried to keep the TPP going. It does not include China. But in some ways, uh, I think the RCEP that does include China is, is more active at the moment. Um, you're getting a lot of investments from China into Southeast Asia. So this made a lot of news when Didi Chuxing and SoftBank put $2 billion behind the ride-hailing company in Singapore, Grab. Um, but I was fascinated to find out that uh, Chinese venture capital investments in ASEAN startup companies increased four times 400% in um, the uh, first half of this year to an astounding amount of money, $667 million US. Um, that probably is because of a few mega deals, big deals that are more than 100 million each, but it's still an amazing increase. And the Belt and Road is still alive and well. They've gone up uh, in their Southeast Asia investments by twice as much in the first half of this year over the second half of last year. So, um, yeah, China's regional influence is increasing. Although the people who do business in Southeast Asia point out that Japan still has a lot more influence there than China does. And a lot of the big Japanese companies are trying to do corporate venture capital and trying to become more actively involved with the growth of the middle class in Southeast Asia. So this is, what's it going to do to edge computing, right? <laughs> this is the question. Yeah, go ahead. Is Chinese investment going in particular countries more? Or can you find the the majority is going into Thailand and Vietnam and Malaysia. Uh, and in that regard, it's a little different from world patterns of investment into Southeast Asia, where most of that is going into Singapore. And the second to Singapore is Indonesia on a worldwide level. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. There's perception of threat by the U.S. government of the long-term uh, ramification of the Chinese One Belt Initiative mm -hmm. that would connect Asia to Africa involving many, many, many nations. Uh, so they're doing proactive uh, prevention of 
Chinese domination of technology uh, Maybe. spreading through this uh, One Belt, One Road project. I think One Belt, One Road did shake up a lot of people yes. and made a lot of people concerned. Uh, whether this is purely emotional, you know, we've got to contain China. If you're Chinese, that's what it looks like. They're, they're just trying to keep our economy from growing. They're trying to keep us from having the influence that would naturally come with a, the world's biggest economy. Uh, if you're in the U.S., though, you worry about the uh, national security aspects of someone who is not necessarily an ally uh, having more influence around the world than you do. So I don't know. Um, I think an American would argue back that it's not aimed at containment, but that it is aimed at, at um, meeting our national security needs. Okay, uh, but yeah, this is this is one of the big problems with this is it is it looks very different in the two different places, and I think that what you can say for sure is that unless we have some things to do together, then the two systems are just going to go further and further apart. Now, my take on that, no matter which side you want to follow in this, is that the ultimate losers are probably consumers. Because when you have a small number of extremely large companies controlling the market, and over there, it's, you know, BAT, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent. Maybe put in Huawei, too, right? Uh, and over here, it's either Fang or, or Faga or whatever you call it, Facebook, Amazon, Google, and, and whoever, Netflix. Uh, people have less choices. So if you really do have world competition, normal consumers should have more choices, and that should be better for everybody. That's the, that's the way it looks, right? So that's globalization versus... Yeah, it is. That's exactly <laughs> right. Um, now, again, people have very impassioned views for both sides. And I don't really need to get into that uh, in this series. Just recognize that these are the consequences you're going to face, right? So how's this going to play out in, uh, you know, in, in edge computing? As I stand here in front of you, I've got to say, I don't know. That's why we're doing this series, is so I can bring in people who I think will bring us information from different aspects of the edge computing world that might enlighten us as to what kind of emerging trends are beginning. Um, so next week, I'm really happy that Professor Paul Raj can come and speak to us about 5G. Um, 5G, fifth generation mobile, uh, fifth generation communications networks are really a huge enabling factor for edge computing. But the amount of infrastructure investment is staggering uh, because of differences in frequency, you have to put the towers for antennas for a 5G system a lot closer together than you do for what we have now, 4G. Five times as many base stations, base station towers for a 5G network. So uh, this is a huge amount of, of investment that's going to be required to bring in 5G. It's one of these key technologies that the U.S. has been concerned about, uh, and one of the reasons that it's, it's definitely being treated, treated as one of these national kind of security implication technologies. And uh, Professor Paul Raj is not only an expert who has been on the faculty at Stanford for a long time and, and won the Marconi Prize, um, he's an active consultant, consultant to industry and advisor to foreign governments. And I promised him I wouldn't say who. But uh, he's talked to a lot of these countries about adopting 5G technology. So I'm hoping he'll address this next week. Two weeks from now, we've got uh, Gary from Intel, who's going to talk about these uh, chips 
for processing AI functions. Uh, Gary was with a startup company named Movidius that had an AI acceleration device, and uh, they were bought by Intel. They are um, going to um, definitely, Intel, Intel is, is, is really at the front of a lot of these new initiatives that are related to edge computing, and Gary can tell, tell us about them. Uh, he has worked in Japan for many years. Uh, he uh, has also uh, a good you know, kind of grasp of Japanese language in, in addition, and so it'll be interesting to get his international perspectives. Um, on the 17th, we've got Dr. Biker, who used to run the CARS lab at Stanford. <coughs> He was the executive director of CARS Lab. Uh, and uh, Dr. Martin Sirhui, who is the head of Alliance Innovation Lab, Nissan, right? Used to be the Nissan Research Center. Um, but because Nissan and Renault are having such good relations with each other, they changed the name. Uh, anyway, they'll talk about uh, edge computing and autonomous vehicles. Then on the 24th, we have our speaker about uh, medical data. Federated learning is this approach where instead of copying the data into the data center, the data center has what they call the global state of some algorithm, the processing engine. And it will choose which of the edge devices, typically computers in this case, it will send for a sample. Right? You've got to pick your sample anytime you're going to do an analysis for AI. And it sends the algorithm to the edge devices where the processing is done. And then once those edge devices do the processing, they send the updated algorithm back to the center where it creates a new global state algorithm. It's a really clever approach. Instead of moving the data around, you move the algorithm around. This uh, is a term that you will hear used a lot from Google. Google, I think, may be responsible for the term. But in any case, we've got a real use case for it. This is a startup company, and they are actually using this for uh, medical data analysis. Um, on the 31st, we've got two people coming to talk to us from the Tiny ML, ML Machine Learning Consortium. Uh, and I'm delighted that they can talk to us because this is also how do you get the operating system and the overhead on the edge devices down as small as possible so that you can do um, artificial intelligence processing at the edge. So um, that'll be an interesting session. On the 7th, We've got um, the co-founder and COO of Gridraster, which is basically a platform company, platform technology company for the mobile gaming and mobile interactive, uh, other mobile interactive uh, application industries. Um, yeah, and then on the 14th of November, we'll have a session live from Tokyo. I will be in Tokyo, Japan, and interviewing uh, Dr. Kanemaru, who's the chief scientist for a little startup company called LeapMind that was strongly recommended to me by uh, a large Japanese company. Uh, and so they uh, have done a proof of concept with this big Japanese company on how to use uh, artificial intelligence to control doors on subway trains. And if you've ever been on the subway in Japan, you know how hard it is and people are always squeezing in at the last second. <laughs> if you can save a second in closing the door more efficiently than before, the whole system just e explodes. It's the equivalent of taking one tomato out of the salad on every airplane meal and saving $5 million as a result. So um, anyway, he'll, he'll, he'll speak. Um, I am talking with a speaker about the 21st, but I'm not going to go any further on that. Uh, we don't have class on Thanksgiving. And then for the last session in the series, 
I'm really happy that Dr. Yoki Matsuoka has agreed to uh, come and do a fireside chat and talk about how she sees edge computing uh, developing. She has a wonderful perspective in this. She was the CTO of Nest, the home energy management company. Uh, she is a robotic specialist. She really developed the robotic arm. And um, yeah, so it'll be great to have her come up and wrap up the series. So that's really what I wanted to uh, tell you about today. This is what we have coming down the pike. Let's take a few minutes if you have questions or comments. Go ahead. It seems almost like a new Cold War of a bilateral, you know, I mean, if they we're really having this bifurcation, it will create layers of technology that are potentially 10 years from now not compatible. Yeah. Um, you see terms like Cold War in a lot of the press reporting about this kind of technology divergence. Uh, I actually saw, I think it was Hank Paulson, who is a really well-known kind of economist journalist, who said that, um, you know, the result of this decoupling, and that's, I think, what the administration calls it, could be the equivalent of an economic iron curtain, where just, you know, people on that side have their economy, and on our side we have ours. for our Navy or other, you know, traditional imperialist powers as well as, obviously, it creates a deep dollar sphere that allows them to affect, unfortunately, to deglobalize. Yeah, um, that's true. And I think that both sides have a point in some ways, right, because we do have to look at national security. Um, I will say my own personal opinion China is going through economic development very rapidly, and a lot of what I see now kind of reminds me of Japan in the 1980s. And Japan had reached the stage of being an advanced economy, but it kept some of the old developing economy uh, p policies and uh, customs going on. And so the country needed to change. Uh, and Japan did a lot of the change by itself. The big difference is that Japan was totally dependent on America for um, security and recognized itself as an American ally. Whereas no one can argue that the economy of China will eventually be three or four times as big as the American economy. There's that many people. If their income levels approach those in America, the economy will be much bigger. Uh, and so I do think that you have to consider your national interest, but is it a zero-sum game? I mean, again, I'm, personal interest would be to go back to more rules-based kind of discussions, to have international organizations like the World Trade Organization handle a lot of the trouble. Um, but that's, you know, here we are. We're moving in this direction. What's going to happen? I saw one back in the back first, okay? Go ahead. So you mentioned 5G as the enabler for uh, edge computing, right? Uh, on the other side, shouldn't 5G be an inhibitor to edge computing? So let's, let's look at developing countries, developing economies, right? Where the, uh, where the prevalence of internet and connectivity is very poor, right? So that becomes a very ideal scenario for having edge computing because you don't have to uh, communicate back and forth with the cloud, which can be pretty bad. That's a good point. Uh, it may be that the less developed infrastructure in developing countries would encourage edge solutions to be found first, even before you come up with some cloud-based solution. And certainly, you know, you've seen that leapfrogging over and over again. Mobile communications jumped in developing economies because they didn't have to string copper wire throughout the country. And then the, the next thing is that you're seeing mobile applications like mobile banking much further ahead in, in developing countries where people didn't have an alternative. This is satisfying a basic need that before they didn't have a way to deal with. So yes, that's, uh, that's a very good point. It's a very good possibility. Who's going to do it? So that, too, I, I'm not sure I want to go into Kai-Fu Lee's 
model of the US and China are the two superpowers when it comes to artificial intelligence or technology. I think it'll be a lot more interesting than that, at least I hope it will be, and I hope we can have more cross-pollination. Thank you, good, good question. Go ahead. I just have a question, so uh, in response to cloud computing, I think a lot of governments, Russia and China in particular, have responded by mandating data centers be localized. Yeah. Um, what do you think will be the response to edge computing on the part of governments, and what will they be most concerned about? So what you're talking about are things like requiring data on citizens to be stored inside the country. And Indonesia went down that path. Uh, it, this is one of the big things that were discussed in the TPP negotiations. Uh, I think that edge computing will probably take a little of the pressure off of that. The thing is, the cloud's not going to go away, though. And so if you're doing something like business analytics, you really want to have as big a body of data to analyze as is possible. And so I really kind of wonder if, um, if it's the solution to the problem. I don't think it's the solution to the problem, but it might take some of the pressure off for a little bit. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions, comments? So one of the features that we have in this series is that we always have refreshments, at least I hope they're out there, after the session. And we want to encourage everybody to uh, hang around and get to know each other. And, and uh, yeah, so thanks for coming today and look forward to seeing you again next week.